David, thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, I realize that I'm the only non-native speaker, so I apologize for my not uh, extremely good English. So uh, what I would to, will talk about is the type three regurgitation. So I have no, no disclosures to that. I will, we will go think about some general things, then I go through the echocardiographic evaluation, especially for the type three, and uh, on the management options. So we have learned that due to the Carpentier classification, the type one, two, three is divided because of the motion of the leaflets. And what we are talking about is this secondary mitral regurgitation. That means that the leaflets are normal and the mitral regurg is just due to the left ventricular function. And you will have a restriction of the leaflet of the, mo of the motion of the leaflets. And in contrast to a degenerative uh, mitral restrictive leaf uh, motion, like here, the restriction is more pronounced during systole. If you have a calcified mitral valve, you will have that, that restriction in systole and diastole. In the type 3B, you have that restriction during systole. And uh, you can have different causes why you have functional or secondary MR. One is LV dysfunction, what I mentioned already, either due to non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy or to ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. That's the same influence on the, on the mitral leaflets. And the other thing was covered by our first speaker, the dilated unless and the normal ejection fraction. That is a type one. So this is a typical example for a restrictive type 3B. So you see a huge left ventricle. You see the restrictive posterior mitral leaflet. Anterior mitral leaflet is not so restrictive. So that means that if you put on the color flow, the color flow will go over the restricted leaflet or the path pathologic leaflet in contrast to a type 2 mitral um, uh, regurg because in type 2 where you have a superior movement of the mitral leaflets, if you put color flow in, it goes through the non-involved segment. So if you have a P2 prolapse, the color flow will go over the AML. So in restrictive, the color flow will go over the restrictive leaflet. So if you have both leaflet restrictors, then you will have a central jet. And you see here in the transgastric view that the posterior mitral leaflet is really tethered into the left ventricle due to the huge or dilated left ventricle. Here you see that from the 3D. You look in the left ventricle and you look up from the apex up to the mitral valve. So that means it's vice versa from the left atrial view. So this is the P3 region. And there is where the most, re most pronounced restriction occurs in type 3 B. Because it's mostly part, uh, the posterior part of the uh, leaflet of the left ventricle, which tears the posterior leaflet. So, what are the recommendations for the um, echocardiographic assessment? The key point is that after your assessment, you should provide some clues on the likelihood of repair. As I mentioned before, in type 3B, it's a problem of the left ventricle. It's not the problem of the mitral valve itself. So you deal you are dealing with global left ventricular remodeling, with local left ventricular remodeling, and both leads to mitral valve deformation. Although the leaflets per se are really normal in shape. So the likelihood for a successful repair in type 3B is if you have a no calcification, moderate mitral analyst dilatation, then maybe the, the repair is feasible. If you have severe valvular deformation, no mitral annulus dilatation or severe mitral annulus dilatation, then it may be unlikely to repair. I will show you in, 
in the slides at the end of my talk that maybe there is a change in thinking about dealing with 3B. So these are the unfavorable characteristics for mitral repair published for transthoracic, but it's the same for transesophageal, although it is not uh, proven in, in studies. So what you are looking for is firstly the global left ventricular remodeling. That means you measure the diameter of the left ventricle with TE normally in the transgastric to gem view and an end diastolic diameter of more than 65 millimeters or end systolic of more than 51 millimeter is a risk factor for mitral valve repair because then the tethering on the cords is so severely that with the mitral valve repair, you will not have good long-term results. The other thing is, if you think three-dimensional, is the LV volume. So again, if you have an end systolic volume more than 140 milliliters, the left ventricle is too large for repair, or it's very unlikely that you end up with a good repair. And the third one is the sphericity index. That means the long axis of the left ventricle divided by the minor axis. So when, if the minor axis becomes larger, then the sphericity index gets less than one. And with less than one, <clears throat> you have really a very dilated left ventricle, and you have an extremely tethering of, on the mitral leaflets. So we gain a very restrictive uh, constellation. Local left ventricular remodeling, apical displacement, I will talk about that a little bit later. You typically see the seagull sign, that means that due to that uh, mostly posterior LV dysfunction, you have a severe tethering on the second order cords or the strut cords, and that causes the seagull sign. That's here. That's how I would paint a seagull because I'm not a painter. And the other thing is the increased interpapillary muscle distance. That means a distance more than two centimeters also is a thing which makes mitral valve repair unlikely to last longer. So all these tethering things, global and locally, they cause the mitral valve deformation. And you have seen on the, in the first talk this 3D picture of the mitral valve apparatus where due to the tethering, you have really uh, not a flat mitral analysis apparatus but severely tethered things. And in 2D, you can measure this tenting area. That means the area in between the mitral analysis and the leaflets when they are closed, so in systole and a tenting area of more than 2.5 or 3 centimeters square indicates also that this tethering is much too much to be corrected by an analoplasty ring. If you do it one-dimensional, you measure the coaptation distance. So again, from the mitral analysis to the coaptation and a distance of more than one centimeter makes mitral valve repair unlikely to last. And the third one is the posterior lateral angle. So that is also, if the tethering is more pronounced than the posterior mitral leaflet, will be more apical displaced in this one. Then this angle will be larger. Okay, so a posterior lateral angle of more than 45 degrees also indicates a severe tenting and makes MV repair not likely to last. So the question is how we grade the mitral regurgitation in that uh, pathology. So normally, if you look at the guidelines, you should use vena contractor, and when feasible, it is good. If you have an intermediate vena contractor, that means between three and seven. So three and below indicates a mild, three up to seven is moderate. Then you should add another quantitative method when feasible. If you have multiple jets, you should not add all the values of these multiple jets. So they are not additive. And in functional MR, that's what we are talking about, the Wiener contractor within four and two chamber views should be used. And you should 
take then the mean average. A semi-quantitative method, which is easy to get and which is uh, in the OR a good indicator um, of a successful repair or of uh, the uh, gradation of mitral repair is the pulmonary venous flow, inflow. You should use both pulmonary veins, the left and the right upper, and you see that see, normally you have a higher systolic wave, and in severe mitral valve regurg, you have a, a reversal of the systolic flow. And you see that immediately after a successful repair, no matter if it's type 3, type 2, type 1. If it's a good repair, you will have a normal or at least a near normal pulmonary flow pattern. If you don't have a normal or near normal pulmonary flow pattern, you should really look what happens during that repair. That is easy to get. It's not quantitative, but it's, it's very, very good. It also uh, is good in mitral club procedures as well. So the key point from the vena contractor, the theory of vena contractor means is that the regurgitation jet is circular. And vena contractor means this diameter of a circle. And if you measure the diameter in 2D, then you can assume the effective regurgitation orifice area. That's what is behind the vena contractor and also behind the PISA. The problem is that especially in type 3, the regurgitation jet is not circular at all. You see that here. That was one of the first publications addressing that issue. That is a typical mitral regurgitation flow in type 3 because you don't have a specific lesion, you have a restriction, and your mitral regurgitation goes along your coaptation line. So if you just measure the vena contractor, you will severely underestimate your mitral regurgitation. Okay, so, and then you should, if you use the vena contractor, you should use the vena contractor in the minor axis as well as in the major axis here. And then you have two completely different values. You add that and then take the average, and then you will have an idea if you use 2D. You see that here, oops, it should. So you should see that here in the four chamber view and in the two chamber view, and you see these really completely different vena contractor areas due to the shape of the mitral regurgitation uh, jet. The second quantitative measurement, I'm, is anyone familiar with PISA and Arrow? Yes. Or, yeah, I, I quickly go through that. So with PISA, you, you use the color flow and the continuous wave doppler for, of the mitral regurgitation jet, and then you can calculate the effective regurgitation to orifice area. And it's the same theory behind that, means that it is circular, and it is not circular. Just a practical tip for the PISA, if you have this PISA phenomenon, you can either reduce the Nyquist limit, as you do see that here, and then use the zero baseline, and then you will have a more pronounced PISA area. That is really, so you see that here, that is much better to measure for the PISA, and it's easy to do. Who of you performs PISA measurement routinely in the OR? Some, okay. So, and, and it's again, what I t told you, the PISA also underestimated because the theory behind is a circular orifice area. So if you, if you use the PISA or the vena contractor, what we do in the operation room is we do general anesthesia. And general anesthesia will ha or has a huge impact on our mitral regurgitation. So that means if we deal with the patient under general anesthesia, no matter if it's a, mitral valve, a surgical mitral valve repair or a mitral clip, you have to assess the graduation after general anesthesia to have a zero point where you compare the post-op result. You cannot rely on the pre-op echo because it differs. Here you see that. That was the graduation pre-op, so no patient with MR1, a lot of MR2 or MR3, and then after general anesthesia with the vena contractor normally, we hardly have some with severe mitral regurgitation. So if you change 
The Nyquist limit for the Wiener contractor, it's a little bit better. If you t take uh, PISA, it's also a little bit better, but if you do the Wiener contractor area in 3D, then you will have at least more MR3 than pre-op. So you really should assess that after induction of general anesthesia. The whole thing of mitral, gradua mitral regurg graduation is an ongoing debate, and that, that is one of the, the newest publication figuring out that, that defining severe secondary mitral regurg, you have to integrate all your measurements. And you have to think a little bit about the physiology as well. So they pointed out that the newest guidelines, pointing out that a um, effective regurgitation orifice area of 0.2 in secondary mitral regurg is an indication for operation, may not be feasible for all the patients. And the regurgitation volume also is depending on a lot of things. And one of the things is, here you have this effective regurgitation orifice area, and here you have the left ventricle and diastolic volume. And you see that it, that is not inter, um, independent from each other. So you can have a 0.2 effective orifice area in a mildly dilated left ventricle in the severely dilated mitral valve um, ventricle. You hardly have a 0.2. You have much more. And the third thing that is influencing is the, left, the contractility of the left ventricle because that also affects your measurements. That affects your Doppler the color Doppler as well as your continuous wave Doppler. So as um, Simon has pointed that out, you have to really not only think about the mitral valve leaflets, you have to think about the left atrium, the left ventricle, and you won't have a severe mitral regurgitation, a long lasting, without dilatation of the left ventricle. So think about that. What about the mitral valve severity and the prognosis? That is from the same, same publication, and you see 0.2 with 303 patients. There is not really, so post myocardial infarction, and the method of grading is with the PISA. Here you have jet area. Jet area is no longer recommended. So measuring the jet area of the regurgitation jet, forget it, although it's still in some, some textbooks. You should not do that. And the problem is with all these studies that they hardly have shown that there is any benefit for the patient regarding survival. So now we have learned about the um, physiology of the type three, about the grading, what about the therapeutic options? So now we have three, I think, the surgical mitral valve repair, the mitral valve replacement, and the percutaneous mitral valve repair. These are data from, from our center, I have mentioned that in my comment. So we are very, very good in dealing with primary mitral valve repair, no matter if it's just posterior mitral leaflet prolapse, AML, or B leaflet prolapse over 10 years. So we are a high volume center. We do a lot, about 400 mitral valve repairs a year. So I think also experience is, is something. So, but if you look at mitral valve repair in primary and uh, ischemic or secondary mitral valve um, regurgitation, then yeah, there's a huge difference in terms of survival. You see that here? So patients with secondary MR have a much worse survival curve over here six years than the other one. And these are again data from our center. It's again, so if you look at the Seattle heart failure model score, after five years, those people who are still alive, they have a little bit better survival after that. But up to five years, there is no significant difference between patients who have a secondary mitral regurg who are operated in mitral valve repair. So it's not really the solution. And the problem for that is, what I, we have discussed a little bit earlier is that apical or anterior displacement, displacement. So this is normal tethering. In ischemic AR, MR, you have 
an abnormal or augmented tethering, which causes the, this restriction of your leaflet. So if you put an analoplastering in, that means that you uh, decrease the anterior posterior distance, and then you may increase this tethering. And this tethering will lead to a residual or um, new onset of mitral regurgitation after mitral valve repair. Here is one example. So this is the pre-op where you see the restriction of the mitral, the, of the posterior mitral leaflet. And here you, ha you see that after analoplastering, and uh, this was a second order, a second order cord cutting. This is the suture for that. And what, but what you see is that, that the anterior displacement of the posterior mitral leaflet here is much more pronounced than here. Everyone see that? So that is due to that mitral valve repair. And if you look at the color flow, you see that in 2D, you see here a little bit. You see here, we are not in the area of coaptation because you see the color jet somewhere behind. In 3D, you can really see that it's going around the P3 and part of the P2 coaptation. So this is not a good result after mitral valve repair for secondary MR. And if you add 3D, you can really calculate the venia contractor in the four chamber and in the two chamber view. And you see that here we end up with a venia contractor of nearly seven, which is at least moderate, if not severe. So you should go a second time on pump and, and replace that valve. We have thought for years that replacement is bad because the surgeons in before or in the 70s, 80s, they used to resect completely the mitral valve leaflets. So when the mitral valve leaflets who are connected to the cords and the papillary muscles play a major role in LV dysfunction or in LV function. Nowadays, if they replace the mitral valve, uh, they will leave a lot parts of the native leaflets with the cords. So that means that the LV function is much better than it was before. And this is a publication from last year in New England Journal where they compared repair, surgical repair and replacement uh, in 130 patients in each group. And you see that after one year, you have no significant difference and also the short-term outcome, you have no significant difference between mitral valve repair and mitral valve replacement. But the replacement provided a more durable correction. That's it. What we see in secondary mitral re valve repair is maybe in the OR it's good, but over the years it gets worse and worse. So maybe we should rethink that. And also the surgeons rethink, at least in our centers. So the threshold is uh, much lower now for replacement. So what are the recommendations and the American guidelines are published last year where they said that mitral valve surgery is reasonable for patients with secondary MR who are undergoing cabbage or aortic valve replacement. It may be considered for secondary MR, maybe if they are undergoing other cardiac surgery. And also it may be considered for severely symptomatic patients with chronic secondary MRs alone. So, but they had to have a resynchronization therapy before. So it's not really the way that they said, okay, secondary MR has to be addressed in either case. And what I mentioned before, there's remarkably little evidence that correcting chronic severe secondary MR prolongs life or even improves the symptoms. So we have to rethink that, and it's, it's really an, an open question. The third option, therapeutic option, is the percutaneous mitral valve repair. And uh, we have heard a, a little bit about that in uh, the morning session. The mitral clip mimics the Alfieri repair. And here you see a patient which we operated on after two mitral clips. They, these were set uh, placed two years uh, before that but she came with recurrent MR. And you see how nicely uh, the tissue is, is there, and it's, it's really, it looks nice. The only thing what we have done is putting an analoplastering in. That, that's, that's it, and the mitral regurge was, was done. 
And if you look at the four years the data now for mitral clip, compared to, uh, to the control, control means surgical mitral valve repair. You see the EMR severity, of course, in the device, the residual MR severity is much more pronounced than in the surgical repair. So in surgical repair, everyone from us, of us would shout if we have a more than, let's say, mild mitral regurg. For mitral clip, a decrease of two degrees uh, will be a success. So that is a huge difference. But if you look then at the functional class, so then you see that it's not a difference. So maybe in these high-risk patients with secondary MR, we should not aim for a perfect result. We should look at the patient and we should think of different treatment options because a mitral clip procedure is done in three hours. The patient goes home two to three days afterwards. With a surgical mitral valve repair or replacement, the surgeon will, least, at least in Germany, uh, seven, eight days in hospital. So to conclude, timing and indication for surgical treatment of secondary MR remains a matter of debate. 2D echocardiography significantly underestimates the degree of mitral regurgitation. Mitral valve replacement is an option when saving the mitral valve apparatus. And do not accept residual MR more than one intraoperatively because it will definitely increase in long-term follow-up in those patients with secondary MR. And if there's anterior displacement after analoplasty, then you should replace the valve. And remember, in these high-risk patients, you do not have a lot of attempts. Thank you very much.